Welcome back to Face the Nation. We want to take a look at the COVID situation around the world. Senior foreign correspondent Elizabeth Palmer reports from Tel Aviv. Margaret, good morning from Israel, which leads the world in vaccinations. 80% of the people over 60 here have been immunized. The UK is doing well too. Nine out of 10 adults over 65 have now had a shot. At the hospital where he almost died of COVID a year ago, Prime Minister Boris Johnson got his. I literally did not feel a thing. But in mainland Europe, things are going from bad to worse. Its COVID death toll passed the million mark on Friday and infections are surging. Parisians rushed to leave the city before a new lockdown put a stop to travel as of this weekend. Those left behind will be able to meet outside for exercise, but not much else. The vaccine rollout in Europe has been slow, plagued with politics, supply problems, and last week a shutdown in the use of AstraZeneca's vaccine because of an alleged link to blood clots. Regulators say there's nothing to worry about, but this facility in Germany shows the fallout. Plenty of vaccine, just no customers. Scientists say this mess will cost thousands of lives. Also struggling is Brazil, where authorities closed Copacabana Beach in Rio. With infections rising, almost 3,000 Brazilians died of COVID-19 on Friday alone. And finally in Mexico, public health in action. Wrestlers took masks to the maskless. Resistance was futile. Here in Israel, the effect of the mass vaccinations is clear. Deaths are down to under 10 a day, and the economy has pretty much fully reopened. Margaret? Liz, thank you. As part of our continuing efforts to learn from experience in terms of the coronavirus pandemic, we spoke Saturday with Dr. Mansaf Slawi, the former chief scientific advisor of Operation Warp Speed, the vaccine development effort under the Trump administration. President Biden has said that the Trump administration had not contracted for enough vaccine doses when he took office. As recently as a month ago, Biden blamed the Trump administration, saying... America had no real plan to vaccinate most of the country. My predecessor failed to order enough vaccines, failed to mobilize the effort to administer the shots, failed to set up vaccine centers. That changed the moment we took office. Is that fair? I think that's a very negative description of the reality. I do think that uh, we had plans. And in fact, 90% of what's happening now is the plan that we had. Uh, of course, the first thing was to accelerate the development of the vaccine. We contracted specifically 100 million doses of vaccine, but also built into the contracts options to acquire more vaccines once we knew they are effective. And the plan was to order more vaccines when, when we knew they are more effective. So I think what's happening is right, but I think what's happening is, frankly, what was the plan substantially what was the plan. You say 90% of what's happening now is what you put into place? I think in terms of manufacturing and supply and distribution, which is the physical shipment of vaccine to immunization site, the answer is yes, because there's a ramp up in manufacturing as always happens. And that's what we are experiencing and seeing. I do think that in terms of immunization and shots in arms, in particular, the large vaccination sites in, you know, sports arenas and, and the likes uh, and the participation of FEMA, those were not uh, parts of the plan. And they are participating to accelerate, I think, to some extent, the immunization. But the bulk of vaccine distribution is happening uh, in the healthcare centers and now in the pharmacies. And that was all part of the plan. Where do you think that there were flaws in, in this strategy? Because certainly on the vaccine rollout, we hear from governors, we hear from those who have to do this last mile of administering it, that there were problems, that there still are problems. I think we have failed to communicate the fact that vaccine doses availability is going to be, you know, uh, slow over time because, because we went so fast. There is no stock of vaccine. It was impossible to have enough vaccine doses quickly enough compared to the expectations. So we were unable, as we communicated in the month of 
November and December and January to, to manage the expectation. In the actual immunization, the approach taken was a philosophical approach that was, frankly, part of what the previous administration philosophy is, which is the federal government is going to provide vaccine. The states should be accountable for actually immunizing. And that's, that's the principle on which we have worked. Clearly, there was a need for the states to actually learn, which they did in reality, and they, that's how improvements are happening now, and also for the central government to participate to that learning process and, and accelerate it. One of the things that President Biden did do was to get Merck, a competitor to Johnson & Johnson, to step up and help them uh, produce supply, to make up for their own shortfall. Did Operation Warp Speed have a manufacturing plan like that in place? So the discussion with Merck had started already prior to the new administration taking office, uh, including uh, discussions around uh, making available their facilities for definitely on the short term doing what's called the fill finish, which, which is the putting vaccines into the sterile vials, and then over a longer period of time to manufacture the bulk vaccine itself. And they have been completed under this administration, and I think it's very, very good. Just to clarify, was President Trump going to order Merck to do this? No. No, no, no. But we had discussion. The HSS uh, had discussions with Merck to come to an agreement to use Merck's facilities for uh, uh, pandemic purposes, yes. Do you think that President Trump's refusal to concede the election caused problems? in the handoff to the Biden administration when it comes to vaccines? Things didn't start very quickly. I don't think there's been, in terms of execution and operations, I don't think there was any changes or delays. Maybe in terms of ownership and full understanding by the new administration of what was going on, uh, it's possible that it was um, not as, as fast as normally it should have been. What we are seeing now, Dr. Sawi, in our own CBS polling is that Republicans, particularly those under the age of 65, are showing hesitation to taking a shot in the arm. What do you attribute that to? I'm very concerned, very concerned that for political motivation, people decide to actually place themselves and the people around them in harm's way by refusing to be vaccinated. I think, I think we need to do every effort we can to explain to people that vaccines have nothing to do with politics. These vaccines are safe, they are highly effective, they're going to help them protect themselves and protect the people around them from the spread of this virus and, critically, from the potential appearance of new variants. Why do you think Republicans are now hesitant to take it? I, I don't know. It's beyond my rational thinking. I'm a scientist not a politician, but I would hope that uh, President Trump and others in the Republican Party should really work hard to engage more Republicans to accept to be vaccinated. President Trump has said he's taken the vaccine, but he chose not to do so on camera. Do you think that would have made a difference? I do think it makes a difference. I think uh, people project images and uh, can convey important messaging. The response to the virus continues to be a political issue. This week, Senator Rand Paul mocked Dr. Fauci for continuing to mask after he was vaccinated. If we're not spreading the infection, isn't it just theater? No, it's not. You had the vaccine and you weren't too masked. Isn't that theater? No, that's not. Here we go again with the theater. Do you think people who've been vaccinated need to still wear masks? I do think as long as the herd immunity levels have not yet been attained, that people who have been vaccinated should continue wearing a mask when in public and in crowded areas, because what we don't know yet is whether the vaccine prevents replication of the virus. It's an act of, frankly, you know, civility, I would say, vis-a-vis -vis the people around us who have not yet been vaccinated. So, yes. Do you feel like you're stigmatized for having worked for the Trump administration? With time, the one thing I want to focus on is I feel extremely fortunate to have been able to help and participate to uh, allow us to have vaccine. 
and control this pandemic. That's the only thing that counts. Uh, there were moments, frankly, where I told myself, oh my God, why did I get myself into this? But they never lasted long, uh, because the, the mission is way more important than, than, than those emotional m moments. I do believe that it's a mistake to politicize a health issue. It's a big mistake. Many people probably have died or suffered because the whole situation became so political that, uh, you know, emotions overtook rationality. Senator Elizabeth Warren took aim at you because you had worked for Moderna, a company that was part of Operation Warp Speed. You then went and you sold your stock in the company. So this came at a cost to you, but you're saying you think it was worth it? It did come at a very significant financial cost to me, to be honest, and uh, it is worth it. I had major issues with Senator Elizabeth Warren because, as I told her in a video, I don't know you and therefore I don't judge your values. You don't know me. You can't decide because I was a pharmaceutical executive that I am a corrupt person and I'm doing this to make money. Because that's, I know that's not the case. Uh, and I worked for nine months, day and night. I wasn't paid. I didn't ask to be paid. I didn't want to be paid. I sold my shares in Moderna. The one thing I decided I didn't want to do was my selling my shares in GlaxoSmithKline. But I agreed to give any gains if they were to happen to research. I couldn't do more than that. Um, and frankly, now uh, it's behind me. The one thing that counts is we have vaccines, and I'm glad I was part of the team that helped deliver that. Bottom line, do you think America is prepared for the next pandemic? And what do you think needs to be done differently now by the current administration? We have to be better prepared. And the, the preparedness, in my view, should in particular include availability of manufacturing capabilities, which means manufacturing sites, manufacturing equipment, and manufacturing people that are running the manufacturing of vaccines on an ongoing basis. We should be having laboratories and manufacturing sites dedicated to discovering, developing, manufacturing, and stockpiling vaccines, even if they are not useful now, against known potential pathogens that can be pandemic agents. I think it's imperative. I think it's a matter that may cost $500 million or a billion dollars a year. It's a drop in the ocean compared to the cost of the pandemic on a daily basis. Dr. Slawe, thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Our full interview with Dr. Slawe is on our website at facethenation.com. We'll be right back. We go now to former FDA Commissioner Dr. Scott Gottlieb. He sits on the board of Pfizer as well as Illumina, and he joins us from Westport, Connecticut. Good morning to you. Good morning. Um, we, when we spoke last Sunday, you were very concerned about New York City and this new variant, 1526, that's been circulating. You said you would be very cautious. What do we know now? Well, I'm still concerned about it. We're seeing cases and hospitalizations go down across New York, so that's a good, good sign, although testing has also plummeted. When you look in certain parts of New York, Brooklyn, parts of Queens, parts of Staten Island, the positivity rate's approaching 15%. So you're seeing a lot of infection surging in pockets of New York City. What we don't understand with 1526 is whether or not people are being reinfected with it and whether or not people who might have been vaccinated are now getting infected with it. One of the concerns about this particular variant is that it has that mutation that's also in the South African variant, the, in the 1351 variant, that we know in certain cases is causing people who have already had coronavirus to get reinfected with it. And so the question is, is whether 1526 is responsible for some of the increases that we're seeing in New York right now and whether this is the, the beginning of a new outbreak inside the city. We're just not very good right now at collecting the cases and linking it back to the clinical experience. So we need to step in much more aggressively and start sequencing cases, especially people who report that they either were previously vaccinated or already had COVID. When you say we, you mean the CDC? Who needs to do that? The CDC, I mean, they need to work with the New York City Public Health Department, but the city alone isn't going to have the resources to do this on a systematic basis. 
Um, I think they're going to step in and start to do that, but they need to be aggressively marketing to doctors, asking doctors to come forward and report cases where they're seeing situations where people who were previously infected with COVID may be getting reinfected. We don't know that's happening, but anecdotally, some doctors are reporting that now, and that could potentially explain why you're seeing an upsurge in cases. It could just be that, you know, 1526 and B117 is becoming more prevalent, and that's responsible in and of itself, but you want to make sure that it's not reinfecting people. Right now, more than 50% of the infections in New York, we know, are with variants. And B1, B1, um, one five two six is the most prevalent variant right now. We're probably undercounting it because we're biasing our, our screening, our sequencing towards B117. So we're probably missing cases of B1526 right now. It's probably more prevalent than what we're detecting. When it comes to B117, the variant first detected in the UK, Dr. Fauci said this week it's about 30% of US infections. And it's, what, 50% more transmissible. It's also potentially more lethal. When you see these pictures of these spring break gatherings in Florida and elsewhere, does that make you rethink your projections here and worry about a fourth wave? Well, I don't think we're going to have a fourth wave. I think what we're seeing around the country is parts of the country that are plateauing. We're seeing upticks in certain parts of the country. I think the fact that we have so much prior infection, 120 million Americans have been infected with this virus. The fact that we've now vaccinated, we've gotten one shot in at least 70 million Americans. Even if you account for the fact that maybe about 30 percent of the people being vaccinated previously had COVID, we're talking about some form of protective immunity in about 55 percent of the population. So there's enough of a backstop here that I don't think you're going to see a fourth surge. I think what you could see is a plateauing for a period of time before we continue on a downward decline, in large part because B117 is becoming more prevalent, in large part because we're pulling back too quickly with respect to taking off our masks and lifting the mitigation. But I still don't think that it's going to be enough to create a true fourth wave. If you look at in Europe where they're having a true fourth wave, they've only vaccinated one in, one in nine adults. Here in the U.S., we've vaccinated one in three. In the U.K., which is seeing consistent declines, they've vaccinated one in two. So the vaccination is going to be a backstop. And we're continuing to vaccinate about three million people a day right now. Well, Mayor Garcetti of Los Angeles was essentially saying that. But his hunch, it sounds like, is that uh, these variants of concern in California already ripped through his population, that that's just what they saw with the epidemic in January. What do you think of his thesis? It's probably right. Um, the, the two variants that we're tracking in California probably have already become epidemic in that part of the country. And they probably have a level of prior immunity in the population that you're not going to see a true fourth wave. You might see a tick up. But once you get 50, 60 percent of the public with some form of immunity, which is where we are in many parts of the country, there's not a lot of people left to infect. And um, again, we're vaccinating against that. So we're continuing to put protective immunity into the population. I do think that the fact that we've sort of taken our foot off the brake a little too early here, March was always going to be a difficult month. People want to lean forward, but we really should have waited till April. The fact that we've done that now probably means that we're probably going to plateau. Maybe we'll see an uptick in certain parts of the country. The only thing that can be a real game changer here is if we have a variant that pierces prior immunity, meaning it reinfects people who've either already been infected or who have been vaccinated, like the 1351 variant or the P1 variant, the one in Brazil. Now, those variants aren't epidemic in the U.S. They're just sporadic. But 1526, the reason why people are concerned about it, including me, is it could be such a variant. We need to figure it out. We don't know right now. We need to get better at determining these things. Dr. Gottlieb, thank you for your analysis. We'll be back in a moment. The number of unaccompanied minors at the U.S.-Mexico border this spring is on track to be the highest ever. CBS News correspondent Maria Villarreal has been covering the story from both sides of the border. We asked her to share what she's been seeing. Every day they see between two and three hundred people. Every day. As a journalist, you're taught to just report the facts. But riding in the back of a pickup truck along the banks of the Rio Grande River, provides perspective most people don't usually get. When you see a group of migrants... She's scared. There's more? Yeah, there's more coming. ...filled with children, babies, a 10-year-old boy traveling alone from Honduras. Said God, uh, God is watching over him. That's why he's not scared. It's hard to contain your emotions as a human. So he's 10? 
Um, he doesn't know where his dad is. His mom is in Honduras. There's a family up there that's going to kind of watch over him. Fleeing violence, poor living conditions and corruption in their home countries, many travel for months to get here. They are hungry, wet and desperate for a chance to request asylum. A right afforded to everyone, no matter how they get here, by a United Nations treaty in 1951 and U.S. law in 1980. Well, this is one of the main crossing areas where they like to cross because it's it's very secluded out here. We embedded with local constables who are helping respond to the latest surge of migrants in South Texas. You have to be escorted to film. Because federal agencies won't allow media access to shelters or processing facilities. But you cannot be here. For decades, the border has been used as a pawn to push political agendas forward. But all efforts to find any kind of solution have failed. Local leaders on the ground, on both sides of the border, are tired of the federal government's inability to fix the system. Um, this is actually a church school that has now been converted into a shelter for migrants. Have a lot of people from a lot of different areas. Uh, one thing they have in common is they, they want to be able to have their chance to go into the U.S. Ask for asylum. City governments, nonprofits, and faith based organizations are once again bearing the brunt of this humanitarian crisis. So we just spoke with this family over here. She's six years old. They crossed the river. They'll be asking for asylum, and he said he wasn't scared. It is not about whether they should be here or not, they are here. So, what we need to do is work together to care for them correctly. The Biden administration refuses to call this a crisis. Instead, they see it as a very serious challenge. But the word crisis is defined as a situation that has reached a critical phase. A sentiment we clearly saw from the back of that pickup truck along the banks of the Rio Grande. Our Maria Villarreal reporting from the U.S.-Mexico border. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you all for watching. Until next week. For Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.